Okay, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for uh, attending our uh, just another edition of our uh, seminar series in digital and public uh, humanities uh, organized by the Center for Digital and Public Humanities at Kafoskari University. And uh, thank you for Stefano Dalaglio and Deborah Paci for organizing this aut uh, autumn, the, this spring cycle of seminars. Uh, before I introduce you to our today's guests, um, just a very brief um, technical instruction. So uh, we this will be recorded or is being recorded and we will publish this um, uh, presentation on YouTube, on our YouTube channel in the uh, next week or at, uh, towards the end of the week. So please be aware of that uh, if you contribute here, which I hope uh, in the discussion afterwards or in the chat that this will be published. Um, if there's any materials uh, to uh, share, uh, we might share on our uh, GitHub repository if uh, Fabrizio shares us with us. Otherwise, I think material is uh, online anyway, and uh, yeah, um, you will, will show us where, where to find um, respective information and um, presentations. Um, our today's speaker, today, uh, guest speaker is Fabrizio Nevola, professor and uh, personal chair uh, of art history and visual uh, culture at the University of Exeter. Uh, he studied in Oxford and London, where he was awarded a doctoral degree from the uh, Court Lord um, uh, Institute of Art, a specialist in urban and architectural history uh, of early modern uh, cities. He is the author of the prize winning. Uh, book on Siena and the construction of the Renaissance city. Uh, last year, he published a comparative study on street life across uh, Renaissance Italy. Uh, in the course of the past years, he got more and more uh, involved um, into research projects applying digital humanities and public humanities tools and methodologies, um, such as Hidden Cities, uh, the very project he will be presenting today. Uh, modeling and mapping public spaces and the urban environment of early modern cities on various data sets. Uh, the Hidden uh, Florence 3D app was recently awarded a uh, UK industry award for the best use of augmented reality and 3D. Uh, the title of his talk today is, uh, oh no, my notes are gone. Hidden Florence and Hidden Cities, Rediscovering the Renaissance City Using uh, New Technologies. Fabrizio, thank you for coming and uh, yeah, we look forward to an exciting presentation. So thank you very much, friends. And um, all I can say is I'm really sorry that I'm, I haven't come anywhere. I'm sitting in the usual old uh, attic room where I do my teaching and everything at the moment. And uh, that will apply to everybody. So uh, you know, bad luck, sooner or later we may actually get to go places and um, try stuff out. Of course, um, much of what I'm talking about today is about geolocated um, uh, history, um, public history. And so it's a great shame that we can't actually sort of do these sort of things um, live uh, in person. So um, let me just, I'm going to just apologize straight away. Um, it's a very kind of English thing to do to uh, to apologize for things, but um, basically uh, I'd originally prepared this as a PowerPoint um, that had embedded video um, and um, screen, um, screen recordings out of my phone just to make it smoother as a process. Uh, the uh, Zoom couldn't handle it, so I've deleted them all out in the last five minutes. And I hope that I'll uh, remember exactly what I was planning on doing as I go along. Um, so uh, it's, it's nice to be talking at this particular uh, group, at this particular centre, uh, because it brings together digital and public history. And um, in a sense, what I've focused on today is the digital public history that I've been doing um, uh, since about 2013. Uh, some of it uh, uh, in part um, with um, uh, a, a research colleague of mine, David Rosenthal, um, uh, from, from the beginning in the Hidden Florence project and um, more recently uh, expanding out with different teams of uh, researchers. And the focus on this particular work, I would say, is about um, using the affordances of smartphones um, to do uh, history 
uh, outdoors to do public history in the streets. Um, but um, uh, there is other work that I'm doing, which is much more, uh, if you like, properly digital humanities, but I'm not talking about that quite so much today. Before getting started, I wanted just uh, also just to sort of set out a little bit of the parameters. Um, I'm, and as, as, as Franz introduced me, I'm an art and architectural historian um, of the city. And um, if you like my starting point, my interest that sort of underpins the digital work and my um, more, if you like, traditional published work is the inextricable, I would say the inextricable link between people and place. Um, and uh, the understanding of urban environments uh, as being inextricably linked with the people that inhabit them. So not uh, architectural history based simply on buildings and open spaces, but populated buildings and populated open spaces. So in my um, recent book that was mentioned, um, uh, I did this photo montage just as a simply as a way of reinforcing the need for social historians to look at people and architectural historians who look at buildings to think about the uh, embricated connected nature of these two uh, parts of uh, our historical disciplines. In this approach, I'm particularly, I would say, influenced, um, particularly in my sort of thinking about architecture um, by um, contemporary urban theory. And in particular, uh, I've, I've always, uh, since I discovered this work, um, been interested in the um, uh, framing, if you like, uh, that is presented by the urban designer Jan Gale, the uh, uh, Danish uh, um, uh, uh, Sorry, I've just completely blanked on the word, but I have just said it, uh, uh, urban designer. Um, and the reversal of the relationship between buildings and the people that use them. Star architects, you know, the, the big name architects, think about the agency of buildings in shaping people's behaviors. And Gale essentially re uh, re reconfigures this, putting life first, then space, and then finally buildings uh, in the hierarchy. So first of, first of all, it's about it's about people. And um, in thinking about public space, one of the other things that I've sort of, you know, learned to sort of think about, thanks to some of these gr graphic illustrations by Gale, is the way in which our modern world has moved from being one which is, um, if you like, primarily transacted in the public realm to one which is uh, uh, more passively transacted in the public realm. So uh, for the outdoors to be inhabited, it needs to be attractive, it needs to will people to be in it and there are multiple mitigating factors that pull pull people out of the city out of the city streets which in the past would have been part of the everyday and again in relation to this sort of thinking i guess um the the other sort of main theoretical framing elements in my approach uh, come from people such as uh, uh, henri lefebvre in particular the um the the very well known idea of the social production of space and the idea i would say of inscribed meanings that is the way in which social interaction attaches meaning to specific places and this is really key to understanding also how uh, the hidden Florence Hidden Cities project is is derived, uh, uh, conceived. So here we see this in the paintings, the, 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 the sort of congregation that happens around places such as street corners in the early modern city, but we can also see it in in the modern day. So again, something that I think uh, the AR uh, that I'll talk about a bit later in um, smartphones allows us to think about is the way in which modern contemporary embodied action can be uh, used as a proxy for past embodied action. So that the movement that we'll be talking about later in the mobile phone is performed by everyday action today. So if you like the fountain there in Luca, just a photograph I took sometime um, a few years back, um, the association, the sociability that's happening around the water fountain can stand almost as a proxy for the sort of sociability that we might think around um, uh, key sites of urban infrastructure and amenity. And uh, the urban realm of the early modern period was littered with such sites of significance, whether um, uh, designed water fountains by Bontalenti, speaking sculptures such as the Pasquino in Rome, or if you like, somewhat more prosaic marking of corners on Renaissance palaces. And in the mapping work that again has always formed a part of what I'm 
uh, my, my approach in the mapping work here, thinking about location and meaning. Uh, this is a map which shows uh, town criers walking around, um, uh, doing their town crying around Florence in the mid um, mid to, uh, sorry, late to early 16th, late 15th to early 16th century. And these sites are all street corners or small piazzas in front of parish churches, or in this case related to Mantua, where all these inscribed pilasters are, are on the corners of buildings. So thinking about, in a sense, what this does is it brings out the significance of corners as places of inscribed meaning, something which has been almost entirely overlooked in, uh, in um, urban architectural history to date. And I suppose finally, the other uh, sort of theoretical aspect that I'm interested in and is sort of central to the sort of framing of much of my research is the juxtaposition that's familiar from uh, Michel de Certeau's idea of practice uh, practice space, uh, the juxtaposition that we're all familiar with because of Google Street View and Google Maps of the aerial view um, totalizing uh, 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 diagrammatic uh, viewed from the top of the World Trade Center, so to speak, in De Certo's terms, and the in, uh, uh, experiential viewpoint of the, um, the street view experience. And I would say that this is just a slide I use quite often, that that's not unfamiliar to the pre-modern psyche, that idea of living in space, but that someone is also looking from above uh, in, in there. So moving, mo sorry, I skipped two. Um, so the, um, the, so movement is one of the, in, instead is one of the aspects which is very difficult to recapture uh, in, in written form. And paintings, of course, uh, can capture movement. I, I, I like to refer to this painting as a, as a 16th century Lorenzetti. This is a, a painting now in the Museo, uh, in the uh, Pinacoteca delle Marche in Perugia, um, originally from this palace, the Palazzo Pontano in the same city. And as you can see, there are all sorts of social interactions going on in this painting. And they're all, they're all about movement. They're all about the relationship of these buildings and the street that cuts out of the city towards the countryside. They're about traders coming in. They're about elites and young people going to study at the uh, uh, school, at the university there. Well, not university, but it's a law school that's run in the Palazzo Pontano. And capturing movement is one of the things which is really rather harder to do um, in traditional academic research. So now we're going to jump into um, the, uh, the sort of examples that I'm, uh, I'm going to be drawing on today from my digital public history. Um, and I would say that, in a sense, uh, that my kind of approach to this was somewhat, I would say, serendipitous. It sort of happened by, by accident. Um, I like telling the story that I was a, a, at a conference in the um, re recently opened Guardian headquarters uh, in 2012, right by King's Cross in central London. Um, and at the same time, the Guardian had um, commissioned a story from a company called Calvium to tell a geolocated story around their new office space. And this geolocated story used um, points on a map to trigger audio narratives about the area of King's Cross um, using texts such as uh, Charles Dickens and people to comment on what was a uh, is now a very trendy um, area, it's where the new Google campus is as well, um, but which in the 19th century was a very seamy side of the city uh, with the arch arches of the railway station, um, a very uh, difficult part of the city, very poor part of the city. Uh, and uh, the company that produced this was a company called Calvium. Um, and um, uh, I'd, uh, I, I, I tried out this, this walk and within um, a couple of weeks, I'd, I'd got in contact with the company and said, I'd like to try something like this out with history, um, with historical stories. So how would we do a geolocated narrative? And I mean, I don't know how, how much this is a typical thing of digital humanities projects. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on where did the money come from, but it's an important part of these compl more complicated, perhaps more expensive um, uh, uh, research approaches. And so basically, in this instance, I've had um, a, a sort of string um, of not continuous because it took a bit of a battle to go from stage one to stage two and three, um, but a series of grants funded by the, uh, the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council um, in the first instance to do a very, our very first trial using um, the character uh, Giovanni, um, a, uh, 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 
semi-fictitious character um, from the late, 19th, uh, late 15th century to guide uh, the user around the city of Florence um, from the point of view of an everyday resident of the city. And um, that project um, was where we started from, as I say, it was published in 2014. Um, and then it kind of sat there uh, getting some attention, some use, but um, I wanted to do more, but I get, uh, apart from other work getting in the way, um, the funding didn't come through. Eventually we did get um, a chunk of extra money and this led to a, a significant scaling up in which we um, made a larger research team of academics contributing to the project and I think that's a really important part of this is this is this work is driven by uh, academic researchers above all it's not driven by the technology uh, broadly once we've established what the technology can do we're really writing for the medium rather than really rather than um, pushing the edges of, of technolo technological innovation and the other side of it that you can see from all the logos is about making sure people use this so actually finding partnerships that make sure that these apps when you make them end up in in people's in people's hands i'm going to just now switch uh to uh, a short video um which i think i'll show because i think it shows it rather better than me talking it gives a better impression of how the app how the app works i'm sorry if some of you have seen this before So I've always loved walking around cities and showing people what's there, what's there to be seen. And this is kind of how I got fascinated in GPS, because obviously what GPS allows you to do is it allows you to attach the stories of the past, the stuff of history. It allows you to attach them to the objects, to the buildings, to the fabric of the city. So it's an ideal way of uh, talking about the things that interest me, about street corners, about the way that people assemble uh, in shops, uh, the way that coats of arms talk to us from the past about the people that lived in the buildings uh, that we're standing in front of. Rather than just have your standard historian or tour guide taking people around the city, we thought it'd be really interesting to have a period character, an inventing voice, but nonetheless a period character who essentially acts as your guide. And we felt that that would just be so much more immersive. In a way, you experience the city with the character. In a lot of ways, the app is about going to places that, that people don't normally go to, that are off the beaten track of tourist itineraries. So the idea, I suppose, was to find a character that could also give a different point of view in Florence. In this case, with Giovanni the Woolworker. Welcome to Florence. I'm Giovanni, Giovanni Di Marco. It's the year of our Lord, 1490. Well, Giovanni is a, a war worker from, from roughly about 1490. Um, he's one of the, if you like, the disenfranchised majority of Florence. He's a non-citizen. He's one of the people who work in the vast Florentine textile industry. He's one of the, if you like, one of the people who make Florence tick. If we have an imagined user for this app, we'll probably imagine individuals with their smartphone. But obviously for our trial, or various trials that we've made over the past few months, we've worked with small groups, and it's quite interesting to see how uh, they respond in different ways to the audio content, to the specialist information that we're providing, and obviously to the visual cues that the phone screen offers. And then principally, what I found very, very interesting is to see how once they've actually been introduced to the object that they're looking at, they will spend most of the time looking at the object. It's a way of directly communicating information with the visual subject of your inquiry in front of you. Obviously, for an urban historian, this unlocks enormous potential because the fabric of the cities of Italy is, in many cases, still intact. For example, the workshop. Well done, you found it. The idea there was to bring Giovanni to a location where we could talk about a building which was very, very significant in the history of Florence, the cathedral. But rather than talk about the cathedral standing in front of the cathedral or up on the top of the dome, we wanted to take a location which gave our listeners an idea of how that massive dome was constructed by people. So we take you to the, essentially the modern site of the Cathedral Works Office, to the, to the Bottega, where stonecutters still work to create the replacement sculptures that adorn the exterior of the cathedral. 
in the background you can see the dome and Giovanni talks to you about the way that Florence is produced by by workers like him whether they're making wool cloth or whether they're building the buildings of the city when people go around Florence they get stories about the Medici they get stories about the Rucciolai they get stories about the Strozzi whose palace I'm now standing in front of what they really get are stories about wool workers like Giovanni so we thought this was a really interesting way to impart uh, 50 or 60 years of research into social history of a city that really isn't normally presented to people. One of the things that made this project really quite exciting is that we're all increasingly aware um, of how we navigate the city using maps. Uh, Google Maps are something that everybody is conversant with. Rather than use a modern map, what we were able to do with Calvium was to peg the 16th century map made by Stefano Bonsignori, uh, the most accurate map of Renaissance Florence. We were able to peg that to a modern street map. So what the user is able to do is walk around the city, if you like, in a 16th century street view experience, where the environment that they're walking through is represented, is visualized on the screen as a woodcut, an original woodcut in the 16th century. And they can see their own avatar, their, their own self, walking in the 16th century map. So um, hopefully that gives you a decent idea of um, how Hidden Florence um, works. And what I'm just going to do now um, is show you, uh, I'm just checking that this is working. I'm assuming you can see my phone. Yeah? Yeah, cool. Um, so um, yeah, hopefully won't get any sort of so weird messages coming through while I'm doing this. Um, so what I want to show you is how, um, how, because I wasn't planning on doing it this way, how the app works now. Um, so the updates that we've had over the last, um, so with the 2019 um, second version, uh, introduced a whole series of things to sort of tidy this up and make it look a bit, bit, bit better, but also allow us to add multiple stories. So beyond the um, introductory screens, we've introduced a number of other characters. I think one of the key defining features of the app is that the predominant characters that we're using to guide, guide you through the city are, if you like, from um, history from below type perspective. So they're not, um, uh, 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 members of the elite, although we have some exceptions. We've got, we tried out Cosimo de' Medici, um, uh, uh, Cosimo the Elder, to see in a sense what would happen with that particular experiment. All the apps use the historic map overlay and Hidden Cities, which I'll talk about later, does the same thing. And um, uh, just to illustrate the point, what I wanted to do was just to show you how um, within within the app, sorry, uh, what I wanted first to do was to show you that these kinds of projects are become quite complicated with a lot of moving parts. And so the credits here begin to look a significantly more like um, Hollywood production than a normal piece of historical uh, writing with um, credits to lots of people who have helped us out along the way. In terms of the way that the app is presented, you basically get to um, download a number of different stories. I'll come to, um, I'm not sure I'm talking about it. Oh, I will. I'll talk briefly about Hidden Florence 3D later. Um, and just to sort of illustrate it using one example, I wanted to show you um, the example of Marietta, who's a figure, um, a, uh, an imagined figure, but essentially documented within, uh, broadly within the historical record of, of, of um, orphans abandoned at the Ospedale degli Innocenti, the foundling hospital in Florence. Uh, and, and essentially, as you can see here, oh gosh, um, you can see, uh, you can see here, um, um, uh, that's someone's music. Um, uh, you can see, well, no, it's probably all my fault because of all these very heavy videos. Um, uh, you can see here the sites that the walk would take you through, and then you can visualize this on the map and you can toggle between, um, sorry, I can't do that. Yeah, obviously we're not in Florence. Um, uh, and you can toggle between the modern map and the uh, historic map. We opted for a map which was in, originally we opted for a map that was clean, didn't have um, uh, uh, marketing uh, content added onto it. And um, the idea with the with the app is that you have um, a guide character who I now can't hear. 
so that not quite sure why that's happening oh because it thinks it's got running through this may be a problem because i'm connecting my phone to the computer it thinks it's a headphone um so you're not going to hear the audio so that probably makes life a little uh, quicker and simpler for us but broadly speaking what happens is this particular walk takes you through a, a walk of sites of charity um uh so moving from the hospital to number two the orbatello uh, 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 um, a hospice for uh, women through working class uh, a residential district where many weavers concentrated to the hospital of Florence and then via the cathedral to the Bigallo, another orphanage and uh, ending up in the center in the, in the, in the Mercato Vecchio area. And there's a narrative obviously that drives this particular, this particular story. Um, so the, the item, so that's my placeholder for the, uh, for the uh, Innocenti. So the idea with the with the app is to, as I say, is to use the affordances of the uh, of the of the mobile phone, uh, the technology, you know, the, the stuff that's bundled up in, in the phones that everybody carries around, but really to focus on the audio. So in a sense, what we're doing here is a sort of geolocated, I wouldn't call it a podcast, but we're doing a geolocated performance that people activate at different sites. And as I said in the video, the idea is that people then don't concentrate too much on their screens and look more at the at more at what they're looking at. The map is, I think, the main AR uh, in the traditional sense, in that we're overlaying historic map onto contemporary map, and actually that makes for a very playful experience of urban space, and uh, occasionally um, leads to some really uh, quite striking observations about um, change uh, in the city. So obviously, when you're on a uh, uh, Piazza, um, uh, Piazza della Repubblica in Florence, cleared in the 19th century, uh, you would be seeing in the map the 16th century uh, Mercato Vecchio um, area. And so in a sense, as you explore the map, so you explore change uh, between the 21st century and the 16th century, which is the period the map was made in. As I also um, um, have noted a few times, even in the introduction, um, what the map, what the app also does uh, is that um, by putting you in motion, making you walk through the city, it raises attention for sites that are usually overlooked. Um, so, for example, as an art historian, uh, with, you know, with my art historian hat on, tab tabernacles such as these, and um, in Venice uh, there are also tabernacles, um, are regularly overlooked. And one of the reasons for these, and the, um, the main source for the Venetian tabernacles, for example, is a book that basically talks about them in the context of folklore, folk religion, uh, sort of popular religion, uh, is that because um, they, in, in, in many cases, aren't by really major artists, they've stayed on location. And so the only uh, artworks of this sort that tend to be given any attention are ones which have been taken off the wall, essentially divorced from their settings, and are now in a museum. Uh, and there are a number of, of examples of this. And so by taking people out into the streets, you start thinking about the significance of these locations. Uh, this is a location I particularly like because obviously we've got a street shrine. Uh, this site um, uh, was once um, uh, a tavern, which was closed down because of the nuns that lived in this building over here. Uh, and all these bits of stone um, are inscriptions laid onto that corner between the 15th and 16th centuries, all of them essentially marking edges of particular um, boundaries of the particular groups of people in the city, or actually pieces of legislation telling people uh, not to solicit for sex or not to uh, uh, go drinking in the in the taverns because of the nuns who occupied this building. So in a sense, by looking at something which is completely unexceptional, we can start reading the fabric of the past. And I think that's something that the app sets out to do. So to take um, a sort of an example to sort of go in, if, if you like, into a sort of deep dive into how we might be able to do this sort of um, location based, what I've called mi micro history 2.0, uh, driven by location. Um, I want to just to illustrate the example of the Church of San Pier Maggiore in Florence. The Church of San Pier Maggiore in Florence is easily overlooked because it no longer exists. It used to be uh, the largest Benedictine nunnery in, in, uh, in, in Florence. Think of it as San Zaccaria in Florence. Uh, so it was a place that many elite families um, sent their daughters and it was also commission had patronage from some of the leading families of the city. The church is no longer there. And so in a sense, we can work from the historical map and move our way to the uh, contemporary 
uh, scene and uh, locate the church in the um, eastern sector of uh, uh, to the east of the of the Cathedral of Florence. Um, I hope these bits of embedded audio shouldn't crash the system. Um, I really hope they won't. If they do, Franz, tell me that I've done something terrible. Um, but at this site, um, uh, uh, I'm not going to run you through the whole thing. Um, some of the content in our apps is in Italian as well as in English. Um, and at this site, um, I'm just going to just... I always get a particular feeling in this piazza of leaving my home turf and moving into the city centre. This is where I leave the neighbourhood behind and dive into the bustle of the city streets. There's loads of noise from the workshops and suddenly you're among the lofty palaces of the city's old families. Here, it's the Albizzi who ruled a roost. That street in front of you, to the right, leading into the centre, Borgo di San Piero, is also known as Borgo degli Albizzi. That's their street. But it's not just the Albizzi who've left their mark on this small piazza. Its name comes from the church there, to the left. San Pier Maggiore, the oldest Benedictine nunnery in the city. This piazza is like a stage for an amazing festival when a new archbishop is appointed. It doesn't happen very often. Though just recently there was all that business with the Pazzi and we got a new bishop. Well, you won't believe it. The bishop and his retinue walk up from the cathedral. He meets the abbess. They get married and he gives her a wedding ring. Then they feast on the piazza and then, get this, he goes to sleep the night in the convent in a special room they prepare for him. And they say nothing happens. But, well, you can imagine what everyone says. <laughs> a few years ago, one archbishop, Sant'Antonino, we call him now, refused to do the sleeping in the monastery pit. <sighs> anyway, while they get on with it, us, the Popolani, we carry on revelling in the piazza right through the night with a huge bonfire and... Sorry, uh, I've launched the Italian one as well. This one, the Italian version, was a little bit inspired by uh, Benigni, uh, Non ci resta che piangere, as an idea for those of you that know that. Il vescovo, con tutto il suo seguito, viene in processione dalla cattedrale. Arrivato in piazza, incontra la badessa. Si sposano e lui le dà un anello di nozze. Poi fanno un bel banchetto in piazza. E dopo, incredibile ma vero, va a dormire la notte nel convento in una stanza speciale che preparano per lui. Ma dicono che non succede nulla, ma che vuoi? Potete immaginare quello che si dice. So, you get the picture. Um, the idea is, is that this is all informed, um, directly informed by historical evidence and by uh, uh, hard research, um, but it's narrated in a way that is meant to be memorable and enjoyable at the same time. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother hanging around uh, on this square listening to the app. Um, so that's the general, that's the general um, idea there. Um, and I always so, get no, a no, 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 feeling in sorry. this piazza uh, of leaving my home turf. <laughs> OK, right. And so obviously you get a, a, the, the usual set of screens, um, Giovanni the wool worker, an itinerary. In this case, uh, the San Pier Maggiore site uh, sits um, as part of an itinerary which is about neighbourhood. So it's actually about countering the dominant narratives about the city centre and monumental sites in the city and thinking about the um, material culture and physical uh, spaces in which um, everyday life might have been transacted. Um, as I say, um, the, the, this is all stuff you've seen already, so there are different types of map screen. We move between different levels of content, so the idea is that once you've identified a place, then you get the narrated content, the character content, which you've just heard, heard an example of, and I would say um, this cast um, uh, me, David, and uh, subsequently the much larger research teams we've worked with as scriptwriters, which is certainly not something that being a historian equips you for. And, um, you know, it, that, that, that's quite a bar that we all had to uh, get over. Um, and uh, beyond the, uh, the character-led content, we then uh, take you to a Discover More, which is a short piece of audio um, presented essentially by the, uh, by the academic, um, and finally, through the web links, um, uh, we, we, we take you to a piece of, if you like, uh, short academic uh, content, short ad academic articles, which are um, citable uh, and have short bibliographies that allow you to sort of explore the subject a little, a little further. Now, um, what I would also have shown you if, if the video had been running um, is that 
at this site, we, we, we've created a connection. It's the reason I chose this particular example. We've created a connection to a new piece of work um, where we're using locative, um, uh, locative technologies and 3D AR um, to present the user with um, a reconstruction of uh, the Church of San Pier Maggiore on location. Um, now, this is a little bit more of a complex story to uh, narrate, and I'm not going to take too much time uh, to do it. Um, but broadly um, speaking, the National Gallery in London were one of our project partners and remain um, people that I work with closely uh, on digital interpretation. Um, and the National Gallery, this was a first, if you like, a first experiment. And um, uh, the, the context for this is that my co-investigator on this piece of work, Donald Cooper at the University of Cambridge, had previously back in 2015 um, done a uh, first sample uh, digital interpretation, a 3D model, which you can just about see there in the point cloud uh, modeling of the Church of San Pier Maggiore. Because originally that church, the nave that you're seeing here, uh, mapped onto what is now the street of Via San Pier Maggiore. So, as you walk through that space, you no longer have any sense that that was originally uh, a, 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 15, a 14th century church. In 2018, the National Gallery rehung the main, nothing to do with us, but it was an opportunity, rehung the uh, altarpiece and by, by an artist called Jacopo Di Cione, um, rehung hung the altarpiece as the centerpiece of the long axis of the Sainsbury Wing in the National Gallery. And, um, and it's displayed like this. And so this was my suggestion um, in, in our project was to see if we could use a little bit of extra, a, a little tiny bit of leftover money, essentially, and the beginning of a new project funded by the Getty Foundation, which is my Florence 4D project, to experiment with locative 3D. And so this is what you're seeing. You're seeing a 3D model, the, the first version of a 3D model we made of the church. Um, and uh, I think this should run. I hope this doesn't crash. And you can see movement through that model. Is this running? Yeah, cool. Um, you can see movement through the model and the um, uh, evocation of how the altarpiece would originally have appeared within the church space. Obviously, this is simplified. You're not seeing any of the rest of the of the decoration of the church, um, and that is work that will is coming now. We're working on other projects that do that. But what it is, is it's a significant change from how our historians have previously thought about digital reconstruction or an altarpiece. Um, moving from, if you like here, the reconstruction of the assembly of a fragmented, fragmented altarpiece, a polyptych with multiple parts, which can be reassembled as they might have been. Then using line drawings to give an, in, an idea of how the altarpiece might have appeared. And then here, obviously, through 3D modeling, giving it physical um, physical character and setting it within the church interior, which obviously um, has some significant value for the contextualization of artworks that museums obviously are in the business of doing. Because when you go to a museum, of course, um, uh, artworks are divorced from their original settings in the majority of cases. So what I would like to do here sorry, is just briefly show you another video which, which gives you some idea of what this does. So uh, yeah, that's just a the very short promotional piece. You can obviously watch uh, more of that uh, online. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, so that 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 piece of work um, was published in 2019 and um, currently runs in a national gallery. Uh, well, it runs anywhere you want to. It's free, so you can have a go yourself. Uh, it got a little bit of attention. Um, unfortunately, uh, then just as we were, would have built up some of our um, visibility around this work uh, and maybe get, got some users, uh, the pandemic kicked in because so this was launched, soft launch November 2019. By the time we were planning things for the spring of 2020, game over, um, everything's on ice. Uh, in the meantime, we've made a whole uh, a whole other thing for um, another church, the Church of Santi, uh, of Santa Maria degli Innocenti with the hospital there, uh, the Museo degli Innocenti in Florence. Um, and obviously all this sort of work uh, creates all sorts of different other outputs, so to speak. So obviously we've we've done a certain amount of work with social media and trying not only to build up use, but also get an understanding of how people are using it. We've published some research out of this. Um, we've got a book coming up uh, later this year um, with Routledge, which brings together what I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, another area which is an unintended consequence of this sort of work is the fact that we gather um, anonymized analytics about users. One of the things that museums and um, city uh, institutions are particularly interested in about this is that, um, well, in this instance, half our users are using the app away from Florence, away from Italy, which tells us something about distant viewing, uh, museums without walls, preparation. Where do people do this sort of thing? So, and also the last part that uh, the last feature that before we move to hidden cities and essentially repeat some of what I've talked about, but in a sort of what does a more complicated project look like way. One of the other features that sort of um, emerged through the, the work we did on phase two Florence, um, uh, hidden Florence, was that um, from essentially leaving everything to the we, we in, in first version, we wrote the content, recorded the audio, but the building of the app was left to the digital to the digital provider to Calvium. In this um, new work, what we did is we worked with Calvium. One of the things we asked for and paid for was a CMS um, so that we could um, uh, build uh, the content ourselves and test it on location. So our first version of the CMS is what you're seeing here. It's it's improved significantly since then. Uh, but what you can see is the geofence here that you set uh, within the CMS so that people can identify the location that the story is going to be narrated around. And here the larger geofence of the walk region that the story is set within. What this allowed us to do, of course, was to test content much better than we would have done um, if, you know, essentially if you're paying uh, uh, developer time every time you do an update, uh, it gets quite expensive. This way we were able to uh, test and refine, iterate the stories much more. And that was, I have to say, very important, particularly bringing in new people, because it's only when you stand in front of something and listen to a really boring story that you realize how important it is to talk about the thing that you're looking at and not the thing that you want to tell people about. And uh, this was really, really key as a sort of public history research learning exercise was the ability to test and repeat. So what we took all of that from, from that, we took a bunch of uh, ideas and learning, and that's gone into um, uh, a, a, a subsequently funded, but quite soon after funded. So essentially ideas were coming through and we built this into a HERA project, which I currently lead uh, called Hidden, well, it's called um, Public Renaissance, Urban Cultures of Public Space Between Early Modern Europe and the Present. And you can see why we came up with a shorter title for the public facing side of this project, which is Hidden Cities. Um, so Hidden Cities um, is a five university project, which has five primary case studies. Um, it's a comparative public space project, uh, and it's looking across uh, uh, participant countries and participant regions where our project uh, investigators are distributed. So you can see them on the on the map there. I'll come back to the website shortly. The project is also uh, delivered um, with uh, active participation from museum partners. And so what was particular, what was new about the hidden cities in comparison to hidden Florence is the role of material culture. So what we, uh, beyond the architectural fabric, what we wanted was objects in museums, displaced in museums to be put back in relation to where they had meaning. Uh, and so here we worked with museums in order to identify objects, often overlooked objects in museum collections, and relocate them through using, through using the app. Here again, you're going to have to be a little bit patient because 
um, the uh, next stream would have been done through um, embedded uh, video, uh, but um, I'm just going to quickly show you a couple of examples, uh, again, from our um, previous, from the, from my phone, which should, again, should be running fine here. So um, basically what, again, what we've done is using the same CMS or an updated version of the CMS, we've used pretty much the same format. So essentially the format has become the format for the Hidden Cities apps. And so there's the same screens, but these are obviously modified in relation to the different projects. Um, at this stage, um, Hidden Trento has one walk in it, but there are two more currently being worked on. And um, the, the, the major change that you might be able to notice on the screen is the fact that we're offering, we're providing the content in multiple languages, uh, given that this is, um, is Trentino. Uh, in addition to English, which runs in all of the apps, it's also provided in German and Italian. Um, in this case, again, uh, following the history, so to speak, history from the below approach, we have an innkeeper as the guide, a German innkeeper, who essentially is able to, therefore, to bring you, uh, bring a story which, which engages its issues such as migration, mobility, uh, sociability around taverns because she's an innkeeper and various other aspects of the fabric uh, of uh, Trento at the, the, the public spaces of Trento at the time. And again, it works with the similar, very similar dynamic with the uh, map overlay um, uh, traced onto the city fabric. Uh, as I said, the audio annoyingly doesn't work because of the way that I'm um, presenting this. Uh, I mean, I might just try it, but I don't think it will. Um, no, it's not audible. It's not audible. Um, so basically, uh, if I so just going back there, what I'd chosen was to take you from the to the second site on the walk, which is a tavern. Uh, the tavern is the Rose Inn, which Ursula uh, was the tavern keeper of. You can then subsequently hear, uh, you know, expert content about the. Uh, uh, host, uh, the, uh, the tavern and innkeeping in Trento in, in the uh, early 16th century. And um, you can um, uh, hear that, yeah, as I say, you can get that extra content, which is related, as you can see, to a museum object. That museum object directly links to the website. I'm going to do that bit uh, later. Uh, and so we did this, we've done this with um, uh, five um, cities, uh, as I um, as I already said, so you can see here the original hidden Florence and hidden um, hidden Florence and the Florence 3D, and then the five other apps. Um, just as a because this will also work in relation to the final bit that I want to talk about. Um, Oh gosh, I didn't realize it was going to, of course it shows. At the moment I'm using this for teaching, which is where I was going to close on, which is why there are some random bits of content here. The Hidden Exeter only contains this. Uh, and so it does the same as Hidden Trento. Uh, it has a guide character. It is also provided in German. Uh, you can um, zoom uh, the map, which in this case is very distorted because the, his the historic map is very, very different to the, uh, so this leads us into a discussion of cartography. Um, and uh, it also contains things like taverns, um, so places of sociability, which are semi-public, if you like, on the edges between public and private space. And um, it also uh, uses objects in museum collections, such as, uh, for instance, here, um, a drawing uh, of a uh, fountain, which is now lost, or um, a uh, sculpture that stood on that site and is in our local Royal Albert Memorial Museum. So, huh, gosh, it's been a bit of a um, quick canter through. The point that I would have um, I'm nearly, I'm nearly there. So the project website, which I think you're now seeing, um, yeah, um, is uh, is designed to be uh, to sort of dialogue directly with the app. So uh, essentially, apart from giving you links to the apps, it uh, allows you to go to the different cities. We'll start from Trento, um, as I uh, suggested, um, and what the map, what the app does. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's geospatial geospatially driven map in which the sites are the same sites as um, in the app. 
Uh, it's extensible, so as we add new stories, so we can add new content. And it's a, it basically off, uh, runs off a live database, um, which contains all the content that we're pushing to uh, pushing to the map. So from the app, you would come to this page. You would see the museum, uh, the the museum object, and you'd be able to read um, a long, a longer text, like in Hidden Florence, about uh, about the object itself, which again is authored in this instance by Rosa Salzberg, and is provided in uh, multiple languages. Again, what's different about uh, this? website is what we were looking to do is to develop, go further than simply have standalone apps and look at the way that the five cities might find points of interaction, points of overlap. So what we're looking for, if you like, is similarities rather than contrasts around the, across the European region. And this is done by, um, I would say, um, a still to be improved uh, simple algorithm that looks at metadata that we've attached to each of the sites and which allows you to um, essentially see connections. It draws out connections. So you could move from a tavern in Prento to a tavern in Exeter and its associated objects. Uh, and obviously over here, this is happening in exactly the same way. And it's, you know, you can get rid of the historic map. You can read about the historic map also. So the way that the website is designed is that a, it can be extended to accommodate new cities or new walks within uh, within the existing uh, within the existing cities, and it also is designed to try and create connections across uh, the, re the the research itself. So, just to finish off, because um, I think I've probably been rambling on long enough, um, uh, the the there's the there's the project website. Um, the CMS that we used is, um, as you see, is, is slightly tidied up. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to build. So now we build the entire app uh, in-house, so to speak, and we can indeed even test it, um, fully test it, send it to our phones, do the full testing rather than in a slightly more artisanal way that we did in the 2018-19 project. So you can see here how, these, um, how the walks are made up of stories and characters, and these all uh, are nested within one another. And you can see a, a pretty standard sort of geofences that are set up and the walk trail that can be plotted on the map. On the right hand side yeah, there, you're seeing a map screen of the, oh, what's going on, sorry, uh, a map screen of the air table that we use um, for the background database. The one I would say from my point of view, really exciting um, feature that we've is completely unexpected or unplanned of this new CMS is that um, uh, we came up with the idea of essentially making this into a teaching tool as well. And um, literally this last week, um, I've seen the first results of that. We've been teaching with David and um, some GTAs and some of my colleagues, a class, a, 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 a remote field trip class, a virtual field trip class in which students essentially researched and developed a series of stories. Um, using our app um, template. Um, I've scratched out the names of the students um, who will be uh, essentially marked on a piece of group work. And um, we're looking essentially uh, in, 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 we're not, you know, I don't want to overstress the rolling out of this, but as we offer this up for other people to get involved in, I'm afraid with costs because none of this is totally free. Um, uh, we would like to sort of think of this as a as a as a innovative way of doing um, of 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 doing uh, group work within an educational context. And um, the initial some of the initial slide scre uh, screens uh, that have emerged literally since last Saturday, um, uh, which which uh, you know, I was really excited about when these started coming out because. Um, the moment that the student's work is packaged up uh, within the app, um, the app format, uh, not only is the work that might, I mean, it, some of it's excellent, some of it's quite good, some of it's less good, uh, as you would expect from group work, but it looks incredible. And the students are so, uh, uh, um, they feel so rewarded. I mean, it's a course, if you imagine teaching online, uh, 48 students, I've had 85% attendance, uh, 85 to 90% attendance at classes and completion rates with something like two or three students dropping out out of 48 in this course, which suggests that this is something that they got on board with and enjoyed. Um, obviously, there's research that comes from this. We're doing an RSA panel um, next month uh, on this, and there's also a uh, 
Routledge book, which we, we will be completing um, over the next few months to be published, uh, I hope, by the end of this year, uh, which will include both the academic research and also the methodologies and some of the learning that comes out of this. Um, uh, and I can talk about that a bit more later. So that's the end of um, me. Uh, as um, uh, Franz said, all of this stuff is basically available uh, free. And uh, I mean, I can share links later, but but they always just sit in the bottom of my signature anyway. They're hiddenflorence.org, uh, hiddencities.eu, um, uh, and, and you can see the other ones. And the apps are all free uh, on iOS and Android. So that's, that's the end of me. I'll come out of sharing. Thank you, fantastic. Um, thank you very much, uh, Fabrizio, for uh, a huge amount of uh, uh, expert work, collaborative ex expert work here. And uh, I'm sure there are tons of questions now from the audience. Um, so we usually um, uh, um, use the chat. So everyone is invited to uh, leave a note uh, uh, in the chat if you have a question or you can also write your, your uh, question in the chat and I will then either read it or give you the um, uh, the voice to to uh, read it yourself or to elaborate on your question. Everyone is also invited to um, uh, turn on the video, so you don't have to. But it's always nicer to see the people here uh, attending the seminar. Uh, so, but that's uh, that's up to you. Uh, so, yeah, questions. And as I said in the beginning, Amutoliti. Yeah. <laughs> Those who joined later, we uh, this is being recorded, so the the you can will be able to get back to this presentation and uh, look look for the details once we uploaded the recording on our YouTube channel. Okay, so I'm opening the chat. If I miss uh, someone, please just shout. Uh, so I, I think that should work. Then. <clears throat> <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> I mean, I have lots of questions, but I always try to come in later. So don't don't be shy. So this is an interdisciplinary uh, seminar, so there are no silly questions. So you can uh, ask very basic question about aspects that you are not familiar with. So we all want to learn from this, uh, and I think there's a lot to to learn from from the various aspects these uh, projects uh, show. I'm also happy to take questions in Italian if you prefer. Of course, yeah. Uh, Italian is fine as well. Uh, so for those who are shy only because of the language, so we are multilingual, multidisciplinary, everything. Okay. Um, I, I, oh, there's a question. No, I was about to start myself. So thank you. I was wondering. Uh, yep. Val Valeria, uh, please uh, um, open your microphone and uh, yeah, where are you? There you are. Hello, yeah. Um, <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> you have hi. fun in your back in the morning and in the evening, so that's where... <laughs> well, we, we, are, we are in London. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> <Didn't know. laughs> I would choose to be in Venice. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to ask if um, the reconstruction, the 3D visualization that you are making available, which, you know, they, they looked amazing, um, also include any link to the sources that you use to develop those visualizations, yeah. like yeah. historical documents, things like uh, that. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a really good question. So I think what I need to do here is, in a sense, separate out two parts um, of so today what I was focusing on, because I think that's what I was asked to do, was to talk about Hidden Florence and Hidden Cities, um, which are much more, if you like, public history projects than they are, um, I mean, they, they sit more on the public history side. Um, although, as I, as I tried, I mean, I hope I showed um, that the website in particular is a site where we show some of the research and sort of point out to where, uh, and, and in a way, if you think of, the nested nature of the work. The idea is you move from the uh, character led, which is the furthest, furthest away from traditional academic work, through discover more audio, which is academic speaking, through the web 500, 600 word texts with bibliography, to 
an open access article at the end of it. So someone that wants to go all, all the way to the sort of academic end or could indeed work from the academic backwards towards the more. Um, now in Hidden Florence 3D, that was an experimental um, project. Um, to our knowledge, it was the first example of locative AR delivered one-to-one -one scale building in a smart device. Uh, so that was what the sort of focus was on. Um, but actually that project was done in the first three months of my project called Florence 4D, which is a project I'm doing with, uh, again, with Donald Cooper at Cambridge. It's, my, it's the Getty funded project um, that I mentioned very briefly in, in passing. And that project is all about, um, basically it's all about 3D modeling and ontologies. Uh, it's, it's about um, providing uh, rigorous uh, data-driven modeling through a process of scanning from reality and research modeling and bringing together those two strands of modeling practice to create a model which is not just a 3D photograph of what's there now, um, which is what lots of 3D modeling work is, nor is it just modeling uh, from documents, but it's bringing those together. And through the, uh, the use of the CDOC CRM, we're uh, embedding the research in the models. That's the reason why, if you look at Florence4D.org, uh, you won't see very much, is that it's a very difficult technical challenge to do the visualization of that. But within the space of two to weeks to a month, we should have a beta version running, which will allow you to interrogate the model and see the data coming out of our MECRS database appearing on the side. And the next iteration of 3D, um, of Florence 3D, which, which again, we're literally working on at the moment, um, will include hotspots in the model um, so that you can touch different sites uh, in, the, in the 3D model, whether you're doing that in your park in London or you're doing it in Florence, and you'll be able, it'll bring up short texts out of our, uh, out of our database. So it's a, it's a very good question because it's absolutely central. This is not just about making kind of um, nice gimmicks. It's about, again, it's about the workflow. So it's about, we make all this effort to make these models. Maybe a few academics are interested in them. We put them on a website. A few more people might see them we push them to an app, it means that we can then make them a, an interactive that, that a museum might offer users. And we're again, working with project partners uh, in, all the, in all the work we're doing with, the, um, with, an, uh, with a number of partners. I'm not gonna start uh, listing them all off. Great, thank you that very for much. the question. That sounds amazing. Yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> it's a lot of work. You can see. Talking about a lot, of, a lot of work, so I think every every city, every every university, and every um, department of history and art history wants to have this this app for for uh, their location. And uh, uh, of course, so if if you were to to um, uh, develop such an, um, an app for for Venice, where we have problems with the GPS, because when you when you try to uh, explore the city uh, using Google Maps, you often get lost in the in the canal if you really follow. Yeah. Um, if you follow it too closely, uh, yeah. would, would that be a problem to... Well, I mean, I think GPS is probably the main problem for Venice, um, yeah. uh, although although it's significantly better now than it was maybe three, four years ago. So I, uh, yeah. three, I four or five years ago, I, 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 on, on a visit to Venice, um, you know, I went around with my phone sort of seeing what we could do and <laughs> it didn't seem up to it. I, um, I think... Well, I haven't been back to try things out recently because apart from anything else, because we can't. Um, uh, but um, I've talked to various people who who have said to me, well, the kind of level of proximity that you need for what you're doing would probably work, would be more likely to work now. I mean, I would say also that GPS is the principal wayfinding device that we're offering, but it's not the only one. So there obviously is a static map. Um, there, are, there can be written instructions. There's, there's all sorts of other things that can help people uh, find, find their way. Um, and in a sense, that would be one of the interesting challenges of doing a, a Venice app would be to sort of work around some of the, the sort of practical uh, delivery of something like this um, in Venice. I mean, for, to, the, to the wider question of other, other people um, you know, other cities, other, um, yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, um, uh, partly because we are working with a, um, a provider, we're working with a, with a, with a, uh, private company to provide, that provides the, 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 
well, yeah, the, the infrastructure. Um, we've currently, we're, we're working on a collaboration agreement between the University of Exeter and Calvium to enable, to sort of have a, Set set of costs uh, that would allow the creation of new of new walks and new apps. Uh, they they are costs. They do have costs. I mean, I'm not going to pretend that it's it's free. I think what um, what I think the our if we if we then call it a hidden cities offer has is that it's a sort of tried and sy tested system, and it's not just the technology that we're um, essentially packaging up, but it's actually um, the public history process, if you like. So the support for the um, for the researcher coming to this from uh, a standing start, so to speak. If I were to say, well, what would I like to do? Um, it's that what I would like to do is not necessarily driven by uh, individual um, one-off uh, uh, collaborations with individual universities, but I would like perhaps to find some, the right grant uh, uh, tool, uh, the right grant source to do something uh, more open which allows us to take the system and make it more open maybe by just simply by buying a number of licenses so that we could we could do 15 in one go uh, and and a sort of essentially test or, or propose this as, a, as something um, for wider adoption uh, but <coughs> you know there's there's funding in the way of, of that at, at, at the moment. So I always feel a bit touchy talking about the costs of this because I, my, oh, my, yeah, yeah. yeah, my, my, on principle, I would like it all to be free. I would like it all to be open access. So speaking to the question before, uh, broadly, uh, all the work that we've done in the Getty project is open um, uh, uh, and will be open access. Um, uh, the, the, all the content we've written for the hidden apps is all free. Um, the website is obviously, but the the mechanic that makes this work uh, is not and one of the only reason one of the things i would say i mean i'd be happy to i've always said i'm happy to work with other people that would could make this work as effectively the the main reason i'm happy i've continued working with the company i've worked with is that we have almost a zero crash uh report so essentially one of the main barriers for people using these sorts of apps in real world is if they keep crashing and there's an awful lot of very poor apps uh, that say that they're doing urban history uh, and providing a resource for people. But if 50% of the time they fall over, they're no use to anybody. So that's why I would say that, and that's what I've argued with funders essentially, is that we haven't tried to make this in-house because we, um, because this is something that this particularly, there are various people out there who do very well. Uh, and they, sadly, they will charge you because you know, we don't live yet in a totally basher economy. Um. Yeah, very important point. I mean, you, you see and, and, and feel uh, the, the, the quality of, of, the, of, the, of the product, which is, I think, very important. If you are uh, art interests, you, you don't want to engage with, with badly designed and malfunctioning uh, software on your phone. So that's definitely a very, very important point. Of course, everything would be nice to be... Um, open source so that people can play around, build their own stories. But I mean, that's maybe an, an next step. So. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are models for this. Um, there's a, there's a project uh, group that I worked with in Australia, um, or I've spoken with a number of occasions and their approach has been much more crowdsourced. Um, so there are ways to sort of open up the software. Um, but obviously from my end, I don't own the software, so I can't open it up. I can, I can say this new piece of work we need to make, the code for this open source. Uh, but for this particular work, this is the core business of the company we work with. The I've seen the other question here, so we could we could always talk about that one as well. I've got I've got comments on that one. Uh, Eleonora, yeah, if you want to um, ask your questions, question directly here, if you are there, Eleonora. Uh, yeah. Ah, there we Hi. are. <laughs> Uh, so no, I was just thinking about Venice as well, and I think that another problem uh, is not only uh, the city itself, how it's structured, but also mass tourism, yeah. usually, uh -huh. and also because we have narrow Cali, and so I think if I have to stop and listening to an audio and I'm surrounded uh, by people, 
yeah. uh, it would be very hard to focus yeah. on the description as well. So, but it would be really nice to see something like that in Venice, mm -hmm. maybe about hidden places and. Exactly. Well, I think that's the that's the you know you've answered yourself in a way. Um, is is um, so with Florence? Um, what so the five hidden cities are broadly not over touristed cities. So people, a lot of people go to Hamburg, but they don't necessarily all go for tourism. Valencia may be more. It's probably Valencia is probably the most touristed of the cities we've got in the five new hidden cities. But Florence was is a very over touristed city. It's a city that essentially suffers um, uh, the same male that Venice has. You know, of 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 sort of tourists cannibalizing the city um obviously this is pre-covid i mean right now i think uh, there's a lot of interest in um using any means possible to get people back into places but um but but there is also a reflection on what 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 more sustainable tourism might look like so when we did the florence work one of our project partners was the um uh, the ufficio unesco the unesco office of the comune di firenze and in part of their their their, uh, their management plan is to decenter tourism, is to um, push tourism out of the principal routes. And so, uh, what I would say is that that you you you're raising a really important point, but actually, it's one that uh, technology can assist with. I wouldn't overstate how much it can assist with it, because obviously, the numbers of users of these things are not uh, measurable in relation to the numbers of visitors that come to Venice. Obviously, if you know, it got really lucky and everybody wanted to use it, then it would, you know, but it would be easy to create stories that push people out to San Pietro Castello or to, you know, uh, the Giudecca or whatever, areas that are less touristed than the Rialto San Marco axis. Um, and obviously one of the things that we think about even in not that well touristed places is that you make sure that when you get someone to a place, you're you're making them stand in a place where they're not going to get in the way of cars or of a shop or whatever, because obviously that would be a, a nuisance uh, or it would be a risk. Uh, you know, as it is, we have to sort of say, say to people, you know, be careful where you're standing. Um, that wouldn't be so much a problem in Venice other than if you fall in the water. But I mean, uh, yeah, I think it's actually a factor that can be factored into the whole rationale for why you would make a hidden Venice, because there are lots of hidden parts of Venice. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be down a very, very narrow street. They can also be just a place that people don't go so much. Um, uh, yeah, I guess so. But I don't know. Uh, in order to reach also San Pietro di Castello, of course, you have to go through, um, you know, San Marco. But well, I can't resolve the problem of tourism street. in Venice. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but you can start, what, what you can do is you can, make a walk that starts from somewhere like San Marco and takes people out, yeah. you know, because it's an itinerary, you can, you know, essentially you can, you can broadly command the direction you want people to go in. Um, so there are, there are, there would be ways that you could actually try and harness these things. One of the chapters that goes, that will be in the, in our Routledge book um, is actually written by a um, tourism management uh, professor and actually the reason I say this is that um, for now at least the evidence is not um, is not very strong uh, that apps can change tourism behavior because simply even though we have we have more analytics on um, uh, uh, visitor movement through cities than than most people uh, have so so it's very interesting to tourism um, scholars uh, but um, there's very little evidence um, that really supports uh, any significant numbers and so obviously that's possibly something for the future it's certainly not what I'm interested in but it's an important you know it's like a byproduct I think one of the things about interdisciplinarity is that it's all too easy to sort of think I'm a hist I'm an architectural historian talking with a historian but if I'm an architectural historian talking with a historian talking with a de digital technologist to produce a product which is geolocated I'm also creating all sorts of other content which is actually can be collected as analytics and which will be interesting to another person which might be someone in uh, um, tourism management or it might be someone interested in museum uh, uh, numbers and how you increase in museum numbers to uh, through through digital interactions so it actually extends much further um, than if you like the, the if you like the, the, the traditional um, v virtuous loop of public history Other questions? 
Um, you you uh, avoided to talk too much or get too deep into cartography at uh, some stage. Um, um, maybe if you briefly could tell us what, what the challenges or the, the, the problems might be, because I mean, that's one of the great features. So to, to move in, in a historical city on a historical map. So that's, I think, one of the most in, intriguing um, features. So that is uh, attractive mm -hmm. for, for the users, but I, I, I'm, uh, can imagine that this is quite quite complicated because I mean uh, the, the mapping the maps. Uh, yeah. So so basically, um, I mean I can I can just sort of show you briefly. Um, uh, hang on, find my mouse here. Um, so in in the website uh, here. Um, We've uh, essentially adopted a sort of a shorthand approach, um, which was recommend, which was advised by the uh, data visualization, sort of geospatial data visualization um, people we, we've worked with on this, and that is to essentially attribute multi, um, a double uh, a double site to points on the map. So in order, because this is one of the hardest maps to work with, because this is a very beautiful. Um, uh, is it very early 16th, very late 15th? I think it's very early 16th. Uh, there, there, there is up there, Vavasori's map of Trento, um, which you can see is uh, incredibly high uh, resolution and you can zoom into very nicely. But um, it's uh, apart from, there are, there are multiple factors to keep in mind. One is look at the river. So the river has moved in Trento altogether and you can see that the uh, walls of the medieval city uh, essentially follow the contour of the original river. So there are changes that can happen. Um, so one of the things that we did here was rather than distort the map too much, we chose to, um, to attribute a map code and a, sp and, and an X and a lat long code. So we've, we've essentially given two geospatial coordinates so that we don't need to distort the map so much. So that when you zoom out, the map looks fairly square. And um, if we go to, uh, Exeter, which is another one which is quite heavily distorted, um, it's been compressed in because this is almost a square sheet. It's been compressed, uh, but it's not being it's not being distorted too much. In and so and that's basically done um, because it doesn't make any difference. You're not using this map to navigate the city. Um, so it doesn't matter if that red dot is actually sitting on a slightly different red dot underneath for this to for this to work counter, cartographically. So it's a visualization rather than um, a uh, wayfinding device. In um, in the app, um, and this is not work that we did. This is work that we did that Calvium did for us. Uh, we've had to work to get much much closer alignment between the base map and the um, uh, and the uh, historic map, and uh, that means that there is a certain level, a slightly higher level of distortion to the map, um, uh, and those are, if you like, they're bespoke map tiles uh, that have been created to allow that that, ex that that experience to work. Which I showed you that you can that you can toggle basically between the historic and the and the contemporary, and um, obviously that works. To be honest, the Exeter map I was just showing you. It works so, so well. I mean, there isn't, it's harder to enjoy that map as an exploration tool because, you know, because um, there are property blocks that just simply run in a way. And, you know, so it, you, you can't explore it quite the same way as say the Bonsignori. And in fact, most of the other maps you can play around with quite well. I mean, obviously as you get to a, to more accurate representations of, of, uh, of, the coordinates. I mean, Hamburg uh, is is an outlier in our project because it's rather later. Um, so we're using a um, a later seventeenth century map in that project in that app. Uh, it's much more accurate, and so you can really you can you can pretty much walk all of it. In spite of the fact that actually, uh, what you're doing is you're walking the footprint of the city, which was so heavily bombed uh, that 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 the map is almost telling you more about. Um, you know, it's telling you almost a bit like walking in uh, the city of London um, and thinking about the relationship between the modern city and pre-peeps and pre-fire of London. I mean, you're actually, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole thinking about the sort of what does this AR mean to the point that actually, I mean, um, I, 
only talking about this reminds me that we had a whole discussion about how to render the base map um, in the uh, in the website because at first we thought about giving it a black and white background um, black and white photography and instead you saw that it was tin it's it's not a straight Google satellite image it's a tinged green um, and and a, to be honest that was raised by uh, by our colleague um, uh, in Germany, um, uh, Daniel Bellingrat, who we were working with, and who said, you know, we can't use a black and white base map because it's far too similar to the kind of uh, blitz images, uh, and it, it it raise it would inevitably raise, um, you know, uh, it would it would raise sensibilities uh, around around what what cartography and aerial imagery and all that stuff does. Um, so it's been it. I mean. Again, this is sort of peripheral to the project in the same way as script writing was peripheral. But it's extraordinary when you do these sort of collaborative things where the uh, tensions arise, whether it might be about accent of some of the characters or whether it be about the representation of, uh, as I say, of colour in, in, in satellite views and things like that. Yes, well, yeah, it would be a trigger. Agreed. Answer. May I? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. Uh, I was wondering, just a curiosity, because uh, now I can see that uh, well, what is your perspective in terms of uh, expanding your project, but uh, uh, you are especially considering different geographical context and thus uh, expanding on a synchronic level. Have you ever considered? I know you're a Renaissance scholar, but I was no, no, wondering. We have. You, have you ever considered moving on a diachronic and that's involving different scholars working on different periods uh, and let's say 19th century, 17th century, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, that's a really nice, I mean, that is a really nice question. So first off, obviously, I work on early modern public space. I don't, I didn't work on Florence. I've ended up working on Florence. The main reason I worked on Florence was because a lot of people go there and a lot of research has been done. So we didn't have to start from scratch. If you're gonna do something that you want users to use, you may as well go somewhere where there are a lot of users. So that was the sort of reason really I, I did, we did hit, you know, Hidden Florence rather than Hidden Siena say, or Hidden Arezzo or whatever. Um, Hidden Cities is part of a, of a European funded project called Public Renaissance. So again, the focus was on the early, early modern period. Um, so the chronological boundaries are set by our disciplinary interests, our, our, our research interests. But technologically, there is no there is no problem here. And indeed, we're we're looking at some future. Um, I'm not going to start to go into the details of it, but um, you know, we're we're looking at um, of uh, the possibility of having multiple maps, so that if your if your if your if your story is about the 16th century, you'd have a 16th century overlay. If you're talking about the early 20th century, you might have a um, you know, uh, you, so you could you could use you could use a Baidecker map uh, for for Florence if you wanted to do a grand tour walk in the same way as you could use Bonsignori if you wanted to have a Medicean walk, and uh, it's not particularly difficult. It's a, it's a small additional piece of map work. Um, obviously, you know each each variant means that what fits within a particular platform that we currently have and what doesn't. But I think that. If I'm thinking not about the website that I was showing you, but I'm thinking about the app as a product, and you know, in the end, we have to sort of think of it as a product, although that's not really how it started. And I actually still think it's a research tool because it's actually a way of making researchers think about location. It's about the triangulation of object, people, place, uh, constantly. It's it's always about well, why am I in this place? What is important about this enough that if it were raining and cold, you would bother sitting here for two minutes listening to me? And uh, and if it doesn't answer those questions, you shouldn't be doing it with an app. You should be writing an article. Um, but uh, I think from a user's point of view, it'd be a lot of fun to arrive in, uh, you know, um, I won't say London because I don't think that's particularly you know, don't think it'd be terribly useful, but to arrive in, in Venice and to be able to offer a 15th century walk, but also a 19th century walk, um, and uh, to have the AR enhancement of a different map experience as you walk through the different um, periods, because that's the only visual AR we're really offering, um, is the map. 
so obviously the map ought to have some alignment between uh, so it's it's totally doable and it's definitely something it's an expansion that we're looking at now it sounds like some kind of yeah i don't know board game where you buy expansion packs but um anyway there we go or maybe a computer game uh, also um so those are other conversations Anna Spitzbart from Salzburg raises an important question about the storytelling. Anna, if you want to. Oh. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was just wondering uh, how do you approach uh, writing the content for this app? Do you have a profile of a user or what is your, what is your workflow? Well, um, that's a very good question. And, um, you know, you never know, we might even do one uh, uh, there. But, um, <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, um, I know, I know, because I, <laughs> I have I the idea. <laughs> uh, oh, it's your idea. Okay, well, it's very yeah, nice to I'm meet you. With Professor Schrobeyer. I'm okay. Well, that's out. great. So, so Salzburg is one of the places that that is is currently, um, uh, we're, we're, yeah, is is a hopeful. Um, yeah, and I'd love to. I think it'd be great fun. It would be great fun to do. I mean, I'm not. I certainly won't go through the whole um, workflow right now, but. Um, <laughs> It's been it's been interesting, funny enough, doing this with students because, in a sense, um, working with with researchers, people come with a whole series of things they know they want to tell people. Um, in the end, I would say that the 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 real kind of um, challenge uh, working with academics has always been two minutes. Um, so when I first did the first hidden Florence. Um, David and I kind of had these ideas about sort of podcasts on location, you know, podcasts, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. And the uh, uh, Calvium, who, who they don't just do the tech, they, they do user experience design. They said, you know, two minutes max. And and it's like two, two minutes, that's 400 words. Uh, what am I going to say in 400 words? Actually, it's not. It's about 280 words. What am I going to say in 280 words? And so it actually really pushes you to think about the two points you want to make about that particular thing. And then you basically, it's a matter of, well, I've got about eight sites. I've got to be able to walk. So I can't expect people to walk 10 kilometers uh, to do a walk. Um, broadly, maybe they'd give you an hour and a half of their time. So you think about what's the relationship between these eight objects. So you're actually telling st a story spatially. Uh, you don't want people to go that way and then go backwards and then go back again. So the story has to have a logical um, sequencing, which is driven, you know, the chapters are driven, the sequence of the chapters is driven by the logic of the, of the space, you know, you have to be, and so at that point, then you start thinking, well, where's the best beginning, where's the best ending, people may use these, irrespective of numbers one to eight, they may just do them randomly. But most of our evidence seems to suggest that they use them sequen in sequence, it's why we put numbers on them, originally, we had no numbers. Um, so I think that's the basic starting point is, short, sequentially ordered, and yeah, look for a narrative. It's good to have a story and an engaging character. Now that character, um, speaking to RSA, when I first spoke at RSA about this in 2013, I was terrified that half the RSA establishment would stand up and tell me that I was a charlatan for making up a character called Giovanni, the wool worker. And you know, we did a uh, I did a presentation with a really full room and no one questioned the fact that he was a hybrid historical character drawn from historical sources, but not fully a person. I don't think that's a problem, particularly if, if in written work, subsequently, maybe you explain the decisions you made. Um, but the, 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 the idea of the, the guide being a vehicle for a story rather than that it has to be a real person that actually walked from A to B. So if you want to be telling a story, as I didn't really do very well there with Marietta, if you want to tell a story about um, uh, disenfranchised uh, women and um, sites of chari charity that supported those that particular social group, think first about the story you need to tell, identify the character that's going to help you tell that story, and don't worry whether Marietta actually went through all those places. The fact is she probably did. Um, because if you're going to do the research with the right people, and we did this with um, uh, with Nick Terpstra and uh, and um, uh, one of his PhD students, Julia Rombo, Rombo and uh, they worked specifically on this and they had no problem with the story. So in a sense, if it's research driven, if the story works, people are people are going to get on board. The thing that you will lose people from is if 
if it gets too boring, you know, if it becomes too fact heavy, few dates, don't cut out the dates, um, uh, you know, make it as immersive, if you like, as engaging as you can. Thank you very much. That was great riff, insight. Anyway. <laughs> so I hope that will happen. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so we reached one hour and a half. So, I, but I think there is uh, still yeah, there's, there's But I think we covered a lot of ground here, and uh, yeah, it would be nice to continue this conversation. So it's, it has really connected. Hand raised all, the, all, all the fields. Yeah, Stefano. There is a hand raised by Elisabetta. Ah, sorry, I didn't see that. Elisabetta, please. Um, hello. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I'm sorry, I don't really have a video because I'm no sitting problem. in my pajamas very far away from here. <laughs> so what I wanted to ask, I, um, uh, me and my students, we created uh, not obviously as grand as project as you did, but we also did several um, kind of quests in, in the museums in St. Petersburg. And we also created the characters that were not real. Um, it was kind of like a detective story and students were following a sequential part of several um, tasks. So they were supposed to solve those tasks and then they were like moving along the museums. Um, what I wanted to ask, uh, so I, you, told, uh, you, you said that there was a, a teaching part where students were also creative, the narratives, right? Yep. Okay. So, what was the uh, the the educational goal, the objectives, the learning objectives for the students to create those stories? Well, I mean, I suppose what it was. I mean, part, as I mean, it's a good question. And um, by the way, I, I we we've also talked about all sorts of other different formats. It's not like the only format is a guide type approach from his historical past. You could also have other features such as treasure hunting. Uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, problem solving type you know that, that might drive the narrative in a more in a more engaging uh, sort of a way I suppose that, that just as a response to that specific aspect I would say that you know uh, scalable things inevitably you want to simplify them so that's why we've ended up with the format that we have and I think that that's probably what we're we're with for now um, it would it, other interactive might might require other features um, so from the point of view of the student learning um, well, I mean, we've essentially we've designed a course around this. So students weren't able to go on a field trip. They may yet be able to go in the, as part of their, their course, but we would have taken them on a field trip during, during this uh, semester or over this academic year. Um, so I'm tying myself in knots because I don't want to say that it's not going to happen because it may yet still happen for all the reasons mm -hmm. that students might want to go on their trip. Um, but um, so basically what we did is we, we made this as, a, a, if you like, rather than um, research and write an essay about a place, um, uh, research and develop a story about a theme related to a place, document that research, um, identify the story, divide it up between a group of students. Each student takes ownership of one part and collectively they submit a full walk and that's what I showed you with the um, six walks we gave them some starting points for the themes and some starting point readings and then we guided them week by week uh, over a series of seminars um, I'm going to stop there because it gets a bit tedious and uh, sort of a bit like reciting a course a piece of coursework but uh, as far as I I would love to know about more examples of this but um, uh, uh, it it felt like an innovative piece of coursework and a lot different from an essay or something. So it was kind of fun that way. Um, the students are going to do peer review and presenting them uh, on Friday. So by Friday, I'll know a bit more about it. Um, oh, that, that sounds amazing. Lovely. Actually, the coursework is also sounds amazing. Um, just, just another quick, um, small question. So when the students were uh, designing these narratives, were they using the primary sources, some historical documents also? So this is just a second year standard course for all mm -hmm. our historians. So it was basically based on secondary um, mm -hmm. what that they what they could find. So no, there was no primary, there were no primary documents involved um, uh, in this experiment. Um, sorry, that was meant to say. Well, it's great. Thank you so um, much. But 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 it, it, it obviously could do, and you could imagine this. And indeed, I've done quite a lot of work with student interns at a slightly higher level, um, uh, where it would be fully based on primary research. We're in fact going to do a piece of work uh, with a different local 
heritage site in Exeter um, over May, June, in which we'll create a new walk co-created between the museum and students um, contributing. So it can be done. Uh, it's a smaller group, so much easier to, develop, to deliver really. I mean, we'll be a small group of five students, five um, specialists. Uh, 48 mm -hmm. students is a big group of people. Yes, and, definitely. Uh, to deliver something like this too. Mm. I have to say I was completely, uh, at the very beginning, I was thinking, why have I done, why, why did I say I'd do this? Um, but it's- um, That's cool, that sounds okay. cool. Yeah. There's a last, or maybe a, a second last question by uh, Salvo Spina. So that's the, what's, what's written here. Do you also have the connection to, or possible connection to Venice Time Machine, uh, if you want to? Um. Right. Uh, I mean, there's a bit of hinterland, isn't there, when we talk yeah. about time machines. So I've got, I'm just going to, uh, I don't really know where to sort of start on this one, but uh, also because I don't want to, I don't want to tread on any toes or sensibilities. Um, uh, I would just say, um, I saw recently, very recently, I saw the San Pier Maggiore, I'm oh, sorry, not San Pier Maggiore, San Giorgio Maggiore work uh, done with Factum Arte and uh, with a time machine. And that begins to look a little bit more like what we're doing with Florence 4D um, in terms of uh, at least the visual documentation. Um, uh, and, um, but I haven't been able to explore any of that very much because I can't see anything other than the web page about it. Um, so that seems that in terms of the sort of um, scan scanning type exercise, I mean, um, we have talked about, and with uh, Florence, we've associated, I mean, I've registered on Time Machine's sort of loose association for a Florence Time Machine. And I've talked about it with the uh, Comune di Firenze um, as a possible um, thing. And Ville Tatti, who I work, who we have a sort of working group with, um, uh, has uh, an idea about um, sort of drawing together different digital humanities approaches to Florence. Um, so there are various sort of points of overlap, I suppose my, um, you know, so if, if I, you know, if you look at different time machines, they do for different things, possibly the most interesting stuff right now feels to me like it's happening in the Amsterdam group. And um, uh, that's really, really interesting, but it's, it's more at the historian end of GIS uh, than, than I would say we are. I would, um, I think uh, I'm interested in the art historical application of 3D um, to sort of changing how we do art history and architectural history and context. And I'm interested in experiential approaches, which is what the app does and is meant to be very lightweight. I mean, broadly speaking, all this stuff is cheap in comparison to full scale 3D modeling work or automatic AI transcription projects, which can suck up uh, as many millions as you throw at them. We, we the first hidden Florence, uh, including researchers was done uh, 25,000 pounds. Um, and uh, uh, so that's not a lot of money. Um, if you think about researcher time as well as tech time. So um, it's a different order of ambition. But but in my view there, the interesting thing was location, not GIS. And when I talked about our website, I talked about geospatial data. I didn't talk about GIS. Um, for me, my, and I'm just going to say this polemically, my, one of my favorite articles about GIS is called Broken Pots and Meaningless Dots. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, a, a critique of um, the uh, overuse of um, GIS in archaeological studies. Uh, you need to have a driving question as to why you're plotting all this stuff. So I suppose I'm at the interpretation end of the spectrum. I'm, I'm not interested in just making data. I'm interested in interpreting that data. If I was rather strong in that statement, I apologize. Um, no offense to anyone that's in a different place. I think that's a very fair point. Thank you very much. Uh, so that I see a lot of uh, thank yous here in the in the chat. Um, oh, thank you too. Happy for you. I have a <laughs> if, if there are no other existential questions here. <laughs> really uh, like to thank you very much again for this uh, super interesting insight in your work and uh, all those, one, one point that uh, was 
surprising in a way that the users are mostly from from uh, other places no, so not uh, using the app uh, from from the distance which in in times of covid is maybe a, a nice way to at least make these travel uh, city visits that you always wanted to do then at least via app and uh, yeah so that's uh, some kind of consolation for consolation that's right well uh, yeah so thanks for this and yeah so um Thank you, everyone, for participating here at the, the seminar. Uh, next uh, uh, seminar will be in two weeks again. And I don't know if I can recover the exact title, but it's uh, Erma Hermans from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. So our visiting uh, a professor in, in art history. Uh, and she will talk about uh, the title or highly recommended uh, beautiful data, uh, digital context of object-based research and issues of interoperability. So again, a very interdisciplinary approach here uh, with, uh, with Erma and her uh, experiences in the, in the um, digital restoration and digital, um, digitization of artworks of the Rijksmuseum. And so we are very happy to have her here virtually again, so unfortunately, but so uh, we keep the hopes up that uh, we will all meet at some stage in, in Venice or other nice places and so socialize as we used to do in, in the past. So, coraggio. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you very much. much again. And it's been oh, fun so. seeing the, uh, the chat with people from all over um, coming in. So that's, that's great. <laughs>